Thanks for that. Um, look, first off, I just want to thank everyone here for coming to the talk, and I hope you'll be able to take something away from it. Now, as you can see from the slide here, uh, today we're going to be talking about phishing. And in particular, we're going to talk about some ongoing security research I've been doing into how you can host persistent phishing uh, websites that evade detection by Google Safe Browsing, as well as Microsoft Smart Screen. So just a quick agenda of what we'll go through during the talk. Of course, I'll introduce myself and, and who I am. We'll then go into essentially a 101 of all things phishing, followed by a technical overview of the phishing infrastructure typically involved in performing phishing attacks, along with the protections available to you as the end user in the form of browser-based controls. And then we'll talk about the um, sort of year-long trial and error process I went through to eventually figure out how to host persistent phishing websites. So getting into the who am I, I'm a cloud security architect. I work at a leading software security vendor. In my spare time, I run a phishing simulation and training platform. And it was while working on that platform that I eventually came across many of the techniques that we'll discuss today. Outside of that, I've been in InfoSec and IT for about nine years. So what is phishing? Uh, phishing is essentially a type of social engineering attack where a threat actor is attempting to masquerade as a legitimate entity or individual. Uh, and, and really, the, the end goal of it is to either compromise sensitive information, whether it be your credit card number or like your user credentials. Maybe they'll try and compromise your, your host endpoint, or maybe they're just trying to blackmail you directly. And there are a whole bunch of different types of phishing, right? We've got SMS phishing, voice phishing, uh, malvertising, email phishing, website phishing, and the list just goes on and on. But really, for the purpose of this talk, we're just going to focus on email phishing and website phishing. So what I've got up here on screen is an example phishing email. And what I'll do is I'll just talk through the email a little bit in terms of some of the different techniques a threat actor might use to try and convince you to uh, detonate their payload. So the first one being the email subject, right? Typically here, the threat actor, they're going to try and put some form of uh, like urgency on you to open the email in the first place. When it comes to the sender address, they're going to try and masquerade as an as a entity that you trust, right? They might spoof a domain. They might be using compromised mail infrastructure, or they might just uh, purchase like a lookalike domain to do this. In terms of the content, they're, they're typically going to try and relate this directly to you as an individual. And then finally, when it comes to the payloads, it's typically going to come in the form of either a, a link to a phishing website that they want you to click on, or an attachment that they want you to download and execute. So now that we've gone through that sort of 101 of what phishing is, let's get into the technical overview of essentially what infrastructure is typically involved in performing these attacks and the, the protections available to you as the end user. So if we go back to that example that we had up before, wh when I look at this phishing email, I actually see three different infrastructural components that facilitate the successful sort of delivery and, and compromise of an end user. The first one being the email itself, right? To actually deliver this email and it land in a user's inbox, a threat actor needs to be using a mail server that has a trusted IP address. And what I mean by that is like the IP can't be blocked by um, the likes of spam hoss or any of the other sort of bulk spam uh, reputation services. And the, the IP address also has to have been seen before by the likes of Office 365 and Gmail. Because if you just start delivering emails to them and they've never seen that IP address delivering like legitimate emails before, they're just going to take, the, they're, they're going to err on the side of caution and go, you know what, this is probably spam. Let's deliver it to a user's junk folder. So to try and get past this, a lot of threat actors, they'll actually just try and leverage compromised mail infrastructure, right? And when they compromise your mail infrastructure, it means that they can also typically masquerade as you, right? They'll just use your own domain, and then they'll start delivering bulk spam and phishing material on behalf of you. But again, this is where maybe they'll purchase their own lookalike domain, um, or they'll try and spoof a domain. And finally, again, with the payload, right? So when a phishing link is there, typically that'll lead to the phishing website, which is then operated by a web server that the attacker controls. And with the attachment, that is, you know, it's, a, it's an attachment that is ultimately going to get executed on your workstation, but it ultimately is also going to check into some form of command and control infrastructure that an attacker is going to have to control and maintain. Um, now, I'm not going to go into the ins and outs of controlling sort of C2 environments, uh, but I will go a bit deeper into what we're doing with uh, web infrastructure. So 
Exactly what was said before, you know, if you've ever delved into operating phishing infrastructure, you've probably come across Google Safe Browser or Microsoft Smart Screen. Um, but I suppose the key thing here is phishing is extremely successful, right? So essentially, what Microsoft and Google have done to try and mitigate the successfulness of phishing campaigns, they've implemented these browser-based controls to, to essentially try and reduce you know, the amount of successful phishing content that users end up clicking on and, and going to. So if you ever are operating phishing infrastructure and you see this, it's essentially the mark of death, right? Like, red screen comes up. Whenever a user tries to visit your phishing website, they're going to be presented with this, and they're likely just going to turn back. They're going to go, oh, you know, I, I clicked on the wrong link. Um, so if this does happen to you, essentially the domain gets burned. You need to start afresh, throw away that domain, and purchase a new one, and also spin up some new web infrastructure. So with that in mind, let's talk about the trial and error process I went through to eventually figure out how I can host sort of persistent phishing websites. And I'll just reiterate, um, at no point was any malicious sort of content or, or malicious uh, web pages hosted. This is all done for phishing simulation and training purposes. Uh, so with that in mind, let's get into it. So about a year ago, I spun up my first phishing website, right? I just pretty much scraped the Google login page. Um, spun up a web server, chucked the login page on the, the root index of that particular domain. So you just type in that sort of domain into your browser, and you'd be presented with this Google page. Um, and I found within about a day, um, I got that red screen of death, right? So here I was thinking, like, wow, how did that happen? Uh, at this point, keep in mind, I, I haven't actually used this domain for, for any phishing campaigns. I've just spun it up for testing purposes. I haven't delivered any phishing emails. I haven't listed this domain in any links anywhere. Um, so I was a bit surprised when this happened that quickly. Um, and, and also just reiterating, like these protections are available by default on Google Chrome as well as uh, Microsoft Edge, right? So I started thinking, right, like, Google's obviously found my website. Um, and I've really got two options to try and prevent this occurring in the future. Option one, I have to try and make my website unreadable by Google. Now, that is easier said than done. I did some research to try and figure out how I could go about this. But ultimately, the way Google ends up sort of reading websites to try and detect malicious content is they will grab the RGP value of essential like individual pixels on a, on a website. They'll then group together blocks of these, and they'll match them against blocks of sort of known phishing websites. And if I'm sort of doing a poor explanation of it, it's because I poorly understand it. Uh, so I figured out pretty quickly that that was not going to be my approach. Uh, so option two is essentially try and prevent Google from ever finding the phishing website in the first place. And really, there's two mechanisms here, right? Mechanism one is try and prevent Google from trying to like being able to index the website. And then mechanism two is if Google you know, finds the website through some mechanism, present them with a 404 error opposed to the actual phishing page. So that way, they never have a chance to actually analyze the, the phishing content itself. So I ultimately moved on, and I figured out, well, I think the way that Google ended up finding that domain in a day was because I was using Google's DNS server, <laughs> which is a bad mistake on my behalf. So Google, you know, they're a search engine, right? They've got probably just a variety of mechanisms for crawling domains, and they must monitor DNS requests and then go through and index those pages probably within you know, 12 hours or something like that. So I went ahead, turned off my Google DNS, purchased a new domain, spun it back up again, and I found um, within about two weeks, I got the red screen of death again, right? Um, so at this point, again, like I haven't delivered any malicious phishing content or, or you know, content for simulated phishing purposes. The domain is just sitting there idle with the phishing page on it, right? So two weeks later, it gets detected. So then I thought, OK, what other mechanisms are available to me to try and prevent Google from seeing the website? And I'm not really like a Google search wizard. So I figured trying to prevent Google from indexing the website just wasn't really going to be feasible because they're likely monitoring like domain registrations and certificate registrations and probably dozens of other um, capabilities at their disposal just to figure out when a new website goes online. So I then figured, OK, well, I may as well try it. I just added a no index to the website. Uh, and then I 
then tried some security through obscurity. So what I ended up doing here was instead of, like if you just browse to slash index.html, you get presented with a 404 error. But I then added some server-side logic in there to say, well, if you go to slash index.html and then add a query string parameter of v equals t, you would then be presented with a phishing page. And that actually worked, right? Uh, a month later, two months later, the website was still up and running. Google hadn't managed to find the actual phishing page. But the moment I began actually sending simulated phishing content and it ended up in users' inboxes, I got the red screen again. Right? Um, so at this point, I'm essentially like three domains down. It's costing me about 12 bucks each and every time a domain gets burned. Um, and I figured, all right, for this next attempt, I'm going to throw everything at it. So I put together a number of different requirements. I figure, OK, I need to, when, when I deliver this phishing, the phishing emails that have the phishing links within them, I need to include a single use link, right? So whenever that link gets detonated, it essentially becomes inoperable. And if anyone clicks on it in the future, they just get presented with that 404 error. I then also figured I'd use query string parameters as the vehicle for sort of transmitting the single use link. Uh, I'd use the query string parameters to include target information as well as campaign information. And then finally, if the campaign ended and the link hadn't been clicked yet, I would then essentially dispose of that link, right? So it would be inoperable as well. So, you know. Wanting to sort of craft something together, I ended up creating this monstrosity of a solution on AWS. I figured, like, if I'm going to play with AWS, I may as well use all the greatest and latest and greatest tools available. But in hindsight, the easiest thing to do is just to <laughs> spin it up using an EC2 instance, which is what I ultimately ended up doing like six months later and tore all of this down. Uh, but anyway, right, I, I crafted together this monstrosity. It took about two weeks. Um, I'm then like, OK. It's time, right? I start delivering phishing campaigns again, and again, I get the red screen. So at this point, I was like, I was pretty deflated. I'm like, well, I've just spent two weeks crafting this solution. It obviously doesn't work. And if, if anyone has tried to figure out like, how you can bypass Google Safe Browsing um, in the crowd, there's, you'll probably find there's not really much advice on the internet uh, of how to do this, <laughs> probably for good reason. But also, like there, are, there are people that know, right? There, there are other simulation providers that have figured this out. Um, but at this point, like I, I just, I didn't really know a way forward, right? Like I don't know, is Google doing client-side checks, which they're then feeding to their servers on the back end, and that's how the phishing page is getting detected. So I was sort of ready to throw in the towel, and as a bit of a last-ditch effort, I'm like, all right, I'm just going to go look at my web logs to see if there's anything interesting. So I open up my web logs, and that's when I, I noticed. Um, for some link clicks, there was actually a second detonation within about 15 milliseconds of the initial click. And this struck me as odd, right? I was like, how is this happening? And essentially, it was two, two different IP addresses. So I figured somebody must be tailgating off of an initial link click. So I did an NS lookup, and that's when I realized that that second detonation was actually a Google IP address, right? It was cache.google.com. And that's sort of when it hit me. Google, when, when users who are using Gmail services, whether it's free or paid, I don't know if Google does it for all link clicks or just for ones that it deems to be suspicious, but they essentially tailgate off of a link click, right? So you click a link within Gmail, and then they will detonate that link within 10 to 15 milliseconds right behind you. And what ended up happening was, even in, in my solution that I put together, I had sort of made those links inoperable. It would take about 100 milliseconds for the link detonation to be registered, because I was pretty bad at crafting the solution. So there was like a read operation followed by a write operation. In hindsight, it should have just been a write and then a read after that. Um, but yeah, anyway. so. They ended up getting through. They, they were essentially detonating that second link before I had a chance to make it inoperable. So they were seeing the actual phishing page. And that's when I, I sort of started interrogating the logs a bit further. Right? I extracted the past two weeks of web logs. And I realized that Google was actually using IP addresses owned by ISPs all over the world. So I essentially did an IP who is lookup on all those IPs. And I realized that a common scenario was uh, for all of these different IPs, even though Google doesn't own the IP address blocks, they're, they're still listing the reverse DNS address to some form of Google, right? There's some form of Google within that reverse DNS address. And then similarly for Microsoft, right? They actually owned the IPs that they were doing search crawling with, but uh, another common scenario was the reverse DNS address was always set to some form of msn.com. Um, 
So then I'm like, okay, great, right? I've got this. What I'm going to do is implement some server side logic. So if I ever see a IP address that has a reverse DNS set up to Google or MSN.com, I'm going to essentially present them with a 404 error. So I implement that, and I had success. A month later, two months later, the website was still up. I was running phishing campaigns perfectly, but then something happened. Um, individual pages that were being run were actually getting blocked, right? So previously, the, the previous behavior was Google would just block an entire domain, right? You went to any page on that domain and it would just be a red screen. But now, if you went to like slash company, it would be, you know, you'd get, uh, like you'd be able to go to it, but if you went to like slash Office 365 or something like that, it would be blocked. So that sort of got me thinking, right? If they're blocking page values, what I need to do is essentially try and um, change the way that I am essentially getting users to land on those pages. But first of all, I had to have a bit of a think, right? Like, if Google can't see these pages, why are they blocking the pages in the first place? And that's when it sort of hit me that threat intelligence providers were sharing information with Google, right? So Google can't see the pages, but all these different threat intel providers, whether it's Netcraft or any of the dozens out there, they can still see the page. So they'll, they'll find the page. Um, and they'll report it to Google. Um, and that, that's sort of when I, I went through my inbox and I realized, like, oh, I've actually got dozens of these notifications from these threat intel providers saying they found my phishing page and they've reported me to the authorities. Um, so <laughs> that was a fun realization. Um, but anyway, right, so I'm thinking practically, okay, if they're blocking individual pages, I'll just use query string parameters, right? So that's when I essentially implemented some additional server-side logic to say, you know what, instead of somebody going to like a slash one to get to my Office 365 phishing page or a slash two to get to Google, they would, there would just be like a random GUID in the page um, area of the URL, and then I would use the query string parameters to determine where they were going to land on using server-side logic. So I implemented that, and I finally had success. Right? And that's essentially where I've landed on now. So I've been running that for probably six plus months, and it's been running great. Uh, essentially, Google Safe Browsing and Microsoft Smart Screen have stopped blocking the phishing pages. So when we aggregate this all up together, essentially the capabilities needed to run a persistent phishing website is, is what you see on screen here. So those last two capabilities that I came across were really the most important ones, right? The ability to block list known uh, Google and Microsoft IPs using the reverse DNS address listed against them, followed by using query string parameters instead of page values to determine where a user ends up. And those first four capabilities, they're still important for reducing your, I suppose, detection surface from threat intel providers, but it's not absolutely crucial. But I'd still recommend it anyway. Now, anyway, uh, wrapping things up, um, the reason I've presented this research isn't because I want like, threat actors to abuse it. I, I strongly believe that threat actors already are abusing it. It's really to provide the tools and, and techniques to red teamers, right? Because it's been a common scenario where if you're trying to run phishing simulations, whether it be with GoFish or, or whatever sort of open source tooling you're using, running a persistent phishing website is always the biggest hurdle to, to cross. Um, and also, if you know anyone from Google is here, I would love it if you could create some form of local allow list, so that way I don't have to go about you know trying to implement these evasion techniques. That would be great. Uh, otherwise, that's it. Thanks everyone for attending. Yeah.